So we are privileged to have with us today, Dr. Susan Hatters Friedman. She serves as the inaugural Philip J. Resnick Professor of Forensic Psychiatry at Case Western Reserve University. And she also has appointments in the departments of pediatrics, reproductive biology, and with us at the law school. She is one of our adjunct professors. Dr. Hatters Friedman currently serves as president-elect of the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law, and she has served as chair of the Law and Psychiatry Committee of the Group for Advancement of Psychiatry. She was the editor of the book, Family Murder, Pathologies of Love and Hate, for which she won the 2020 Manfred Guttenmacher Award. And she is also the deputy editor of the Journal of the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law. So she is extremely accomplished. Her talk today is entitled um, Murder in the Family, Perpetrators, Motives, and Prevention. So a very intriguing title, and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here um, today. Just um, one quick second while I share my screen. All right. So um, yes, this this afternoon I'm speaking about murder in the family, and it's it's going to be a, a rather quick tour to talk about uh, so many uh, different pieces of this puzzle. Um, I, it, it became of interest to me long before I was a forensic psychiatrist. Um, coming of age in America, some of the, the things that really stood out, some of the legal cases um, are pictured here. And um, I, I think most of you will remember these cases as well. We'll discuss what's in the public domain um, ab about several of these as well today. So we're gonna talk about the various types of family murder. We'll talk about uh, common factors, both uh, sociologically and uh, psychiatrically. We'll then think about the various motives for the various types of murder within the family. And we'll see a range of, of motives, but we'll see some threads of similarity as we talk about the different types. As we're uh, talking about the motives, I would like one of the things for you to consider is um, the intersection between uh, not guilty by reason of insanity as a defense in some of these cases and uh, the motive that the uh, perpetrator, the defendant had. Now, um, just a quick reminder uh, in the state of Ohio, uh, for example, uh, to qualify for an NGRI, not guilty by reason of insanity, finding uh, the defendant's mental illness uh, has caused the defendant not to know the wrongfulness of their acts. And, and so we'll um, think about that as we're talking about various types of family murder as well. And finally, we will use what we have learned to think about prevention. So first, what are the types of, of family murder? Uh, it could be uh, killing by an intimate partner. Um, this partner could be male or female. Uh, it could be neonaticide. Uh, it could be infanticide or, or filicide, uh, murder of the child. We'll talk more about these definitions in a moment as well. Uh, we also have siblicide, uh, sororicide and fratricide, and parricide, uh, which is uh, the, the killing of the parent, the matricide or patricide, uh, and then finally familicide. So this is a, a lot of different terms, a lot of different types of, of homicides. Uh, for me, the, the way I first start thinking about them is, is what was the role of the perpetrator in the family? And so were they acting um, as, as a partner uh, to, their, uh, to the person that they killed? So was it an intimate partner homicide uh, by either partner or by an elderly partner? Uh, was, were they acting in the role of a parent uh, to those who they killed? Um, and that would include the neonaticides and the infanticides or filicides. Or were they acting as a child? And I have a uh, child in quotes because they're, they're the offspring. They may or may not be under the age of 18 at the time of these deaths. Um, and these, um, the, the third um, point here that I have about child, I'm including it uh, for completeness, but uh, just for the sake of time uh, today for the lecture, I'm not going to focus in detail on parasites or siblicides today. Uh, so uh, why, why family murder? Uh, 
one of the things, and, and for, for me in particular, uh, I, I'm a reproductive psychiatrist uh, working with pregnant and postpartum women, as well as a forensic psychiatrist. And so uh, to me, it's, it's particularly uh, important and interesting uh, because we know that when women are violent, it, it tends to be uh, within the family. Now, as you'll hear this afternoon, a family murder can be related to mental health issues related to serious mental illness, but it can also be related to feelings that probably each one of us who's, who's been in a family um, has, has experienced it at some point, though um, probably not to the degree um, th that um, these perpetrators have, but feelings that are um, relatively normal to occur in a family are, are feelings like jealousy and greed and pride. Um, as, as well as anger and, and revenge can occur as well. Um, and then we wanna be thinking about um, how we can use this knowledge to think about prevention and about public health. So first I'm gonna discuss intimate partner homicide and uh, we'll talk about some of the various subtypes of intimate partner homicide. And uh, you, you might be surprised by uh, some of the information as, as I think we, we um, had had some um, interesting uh, data that we came across when we were working on the book. Um, okay, so and um, throughout my talk, I'm going to in include different um, vignettes uh, to hopefully um, carry home some of the uh, risk factors. So um, this is uh, probably one of the most famous cases of alleged intimate partner homicide. And um, you'll recall that in June of 1994, uh, O.J. Simpson at that time was a beloved football star legend who had allegedly killed his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her uh, friend, Ron Goldman, um, in, in the driveway. Um, what came out was that uh, the killings were uh, vicious. And what came out about the relationship between uh, Simpson and his ex-wife uh, was a, a history of a tumultuous, jealous relationship. And uh, she had expressed to friends that he had been stalking her and she was afraid of what would happen if he ever found her with another man. So he was acquitted in what has been referred to as the trial of the century. And then you'll recall that uh, subsequently in, in, in civil court, uh, there was, um, he had to pay $33 million for the wrongful death of the pair. Um, now, subsequently, uh, O.J. Simpson, uh, got in uh, further legal trouble as well with a case for robbery, kidnapping, and assault. So some of these themes are, are, are themes that we, that we hear in other cases, and I, I think um, helps, helps make it memorable thinking about these cases that we've learned about um, from the media, from uh, popular culture. So what we know about intimate partner homicide when it's perpetrated by the, the man or the husband um, the bulk of the time there's been intimate partner violence uh, documented be beforehand. And then when, when we look at what um, is, is the escalation between that violence and homicide, uh, some of the common strands are um, increasing social, social isolation of the female partner, uh, a longer standing history of physical abuse. Uh, we also see um, within the couple, asking them about how, how they resolve disputes, how they resolve conflicts, um, coercion rather than uh, talking through, et cetera. And then we'll hear throughout these uh, family homicides, uh, illicit substance use and, and alcohol use um, increasing risk as well. Um, some of the motives that have been described for intimate partner homicide include uh, so-called obsessive jealousy, um, uh, anger and uh, feelings of abandonment and rejection. And as um, workers in this field are, are quite aware, um, after a woman communicates her desire to leave an abusive relationship, there's actually an increased risk to her as well. Uh, and, and something else that we uh, are aware as well that increases uh, subsequent risk is um, whether strangulation has been involved in the uh, intimate partner violence. Now, the next case um, uh, from the media, again, that I, I want to bring up um, that helps us think about this issue as well is intimate partner homicide during pregnancy. And this was the Lacey Peterson case. And um, the big reason I bring this up is, um, though it is counterintuitive to uh, many of us, pregnancy is actually a high risk time for intimate partner violence victimization. Uh, 
maybe related to these jealousy feelings, maybe related to feelings of abandonment and rejection in the in the male partner as well. Okay, so um, this this case um, was Lacey Peterson who disappeared in California Christmas Eve 2002. Uh, at that time, she was eight and a half months pregnant, and her husband uh, told the police he was he was out fishing. Uh, he was noted to have a cool demeanor and was described as quote too good to believe in the reports of others. And uh, you'll you'll recall um, that what came out was he had been having an affair with another woman who he had uh, told the other woman that his wife was dead. And um, inconsistencies uh, repeatedly uh, came out in his story. He actually called the, the other woman from a televised candlelight vigil for his wife, uh, saying he was in, in Paris uh, celebrating, not realizing that he was on the international news um, about the what, disappearance of his wife. Uh, when he was arrested, he had his hair dyed, his Mercedes was stuffed with uh, money, Viagra, mobile phones, and camping equipment, and uh, he um, eventually has, um, is at San Quentin on death row. Now, some of the things, though, that we need to be aware of uh, about intimate partner violence uh, is, is that it's not necessarily only in one direction. Uh, more research is, is coming out in the past uh, decade or so, uh, talking about uh, the potential for, for either partner to be violent. Um, this may occur in, in self-defense. It can occur in a uh, relationship where um, both partners have difficulty dealing with, um, with anger, et cetera, and there's mutual violence, or uh, domestic violence may be, may be a paranoid response in uh, some cases with, with mental illness involved. Uh, and uh, so turning to uh, women who kill their partner, uh, one of the categories that's been described is uh, black widows, but that is certainly not all women who, who kill their partner. So black widow, like the spider, this is a, um, a, a, a dramatization of a case uh, from Christchurch, New Zealand, where um, Helen Milner in 2009 uh, murdered her partner. She mixed uh, the drug Phenergan with his food to sedate him and suffocated him allegedly for the life insurance money. Uh, there was a fake suicide note. Again, her affect, her emotional expression appeared different than other widows. Uh, they described her as blasé. Um, her stories also changed um, and she stated at various points he had narcolepsy, he took medication, he was a male escort. Uh, and uh, she in New Zealand was eventually given a life sentence. So what we know about intimate partner homicide by, by the woman, by the wife, um, there are various types. And it's so important when we consider these cases, uh, both from a perspective uh, subsequent to them, but also when we're thinking about prevention, it's so important that we are able to further um, de determine the motive and, and what was going on in the family situation, in the person's mind at the time. So uh, some of the motives um, or situations with women who kill their partner are uh, the abused woman who kills in her, her perceived uh, self-defense uh, and um, may avail herself uh, to the battered women's syndrome defense, for example. Um, but that's gonna be a, a, a small proportion of, of women who, who kill. Uh, she also, similar to the male partner who kills, may have had issues with um, illicit substances. Um, there's also this um, idea, and I, I, this, this may not be the best way of des describing it, but it's um, as, uh, as more women are, are taking what was traditionally uh, considered um, the, the male role of, of um, uh, breadwinner, et, et cetera, um, there may be dynamics changing uh, in these uh, cases of family murder over, over decades, et cetera. Um, also, as we'll hear more in a moment, she may be an overwhelmed caretaker. Um, she may have mental illness, or it may be Black widows. Now, um, this is um, su super interesting, I think, about intimate partner homicide by the elderly. Because I, I think that when we hear in the media, we hear an awful lot about, about mercy killings uh, by the elderly, but uh, not about other types. And uh, I, I want to go into some detail about this as well. So there may be a quote unquote mercy killing uh, to end the other partner's suffering. 
Uh, however, when they look at these cases, it was, it was quite rare of the uh, presumed suffering partner to have made an overt agreement with uh, their, their partner who, who kills them in advance saying, I would like to be killed if I reach this certain point. Um, another um, reason behind it may be that the uh, perpetrator was planning suicide and is concerned about how their spouse would, would navigate the world without them there. Uh, and then the third type is an ending on a long history of intimate partner violence. This is uh, the final thing to happen with, with that intimate partner violence. And so we need to keep in mind that the intimate partner violence uh, leading to homicide is not just a problem of, of young couples. It, it can happen in the elderly as well. And then when you think about uh, what we know about intimate partner homicide by the elderly, it, it would be incredibly rare for this to be perpetrated by a woman. It tends to be a, a gendered crime um, with perhaps this um, patriarchal male authority um, view with a proprietary view of the spouse. Um, as we've discussed, it tends to be treated with sympathy by the media. And uh, we've, we've done a little work in this uh, area as well. And, and we found um, threats of, of separation, for example. So that the couple needs to separate, one of them needs to go to the nursing home, et cetera, or they're about to lose uh, their, their home, their farm uh, for financial problems, social isolation as well, um, physical or mental illness in either partner, um, and again, illicit substance use um, or alcohol use, and then uh, firearms, um, as, as we know, tend to be the uh, quickest way uh, to, to, to kill um, another person in oneself um, and uh, maybe a risk factor as well. So as we're thinking through these intimate partner homicide cases, but also in a moment when we're discussing the um, infanticide and filicide cases, um, another way to um, start thinking about the motive in the case based on, on the data is just um, on the most basic level, was it um, appearing as an act of love or was it um, appearing as an act of anger? And there's certainly much more to, to fill that in, but that, that may be one way to, to start thinking about a specific case. Uh, okay, so then when we're thinking about prevention of intimate partner homicide from what we've just talked about, it really seems that it, it's stepping backwards and working on prevention of intimate partner violence. So it's, it's looking at relationship issues and especially these, these cases of, of pathologic or so-called obsessional jealousy. Um, what are the coping skills uh, within that family, uh, within that couple? Um, is there caregiver stress for um, a, a young partner with, with an ill uh, partner or for the elderly uh, partners? Um, what about the firearms being present? Um, and then also what about uh, drug and alcohol use? And what about screening for uh, depression and, and treating that depression if we find it? So those would be some um, suggested important kind of social and psychiatric prevention measures. So next I wanna to turn to neonaticide. And uh, neonaticide is murder within that first day of life. And uh, neonaticide was actually uh, coined by uh, Professor Philip Resnick, uh, who uh, has recently retired from, from the law school in, in the 60s. And he was doing research back then, looking into um, infanticide, filicide overall, and, and found that murders within the first day of life really looked different from murders, um, murders a year later, two years later, et cetera. And um, part of this may be the, the the infant has not yet established a, a place in the family. And as fact is, in fact, as we'll see in a moment, often no one knew of the young woman's pregnancy. So um, this case, which you'll remember if you're as old as I am as well, is uh, Melissa Drexler, who the media referred to as the prom mom. And that's because literally she delivered in the bathroom during the high school prom. Uh, she put the baby in a plastic bag in the trash can and returned to the dance. Uh, now the, the janitor who was then taking out the garbage found it. And, and I will say in, in, in doing this, this, this work um, and this uh, research, it's, it's often a, a, a janitor, a security guard, someone who's completely unsuspecting 
um, finds, finds this baby. Um, other students remembered that she had been in, in the bathroom a while. There was, there was blood in the bathroom when she left. And she initially claimed that she just had a heavy um, menstruation. Eventually, she pled guilty and was sentenced to 15 years, serving three. Now, neonaticide is um, a crime that, unlike almost every other crime, is almost always perpetrated by a, a woman. Uh, and, and so it's, it's unique. And in addition to that, um, it has a, a wide range of, of variability in sentencing. Um, and if, if you look at these cases, um, some, some many mothers will get off with, um, will be sentenced to probation. Uh, there, there may be some with mental health dispositions and then others uh, with quite long sentences, um, which, which may be um, a remnant of, of gender bias in our system, may be related to um, the, the jury or judges' uh, feelings on if this, if this mom um, is, is, is deserving of our sympathy um, or, or not. So rates of neonaticide, uh, the first day of life has been described as, as our day of highest risk of, of being murdered. Now, um, the, the rate uh, given here is two per 100,000 newborns. And, and that's, that was a, a good study. However, every um, person writing in this field um, basically has, has described that um, any numbers that we have are really considered underestimates. Um, first of all, even if the body is found, the coroner may have difficulty determining, just depending on the state of the body, uh, whether this baby was, was born alive or not born alive. But much moreover, there are so many um, hidden pregnancies and hidden corpses. So as we'll talk about in a moment, many of these young women um, did not know that they were pregnant, did not tell anyone that they were pregnant. And uh, baby bodies are, are very small. And so if nobody's um, looking for a baby body, there, there are so many places uh, that, that they um, are um, placed after, after death and, and no one's uh, looking and no one finds them. Okay, so what do we know about neonaticide perpetrators? As I was saying, they, they are almost always young women acting alone. There are um, the rare cases that, that you probably remember from the media as well, where it is uh, the partners acting together, um, Amy Grossberg, Brian Peterson, for example, but that is rare. It's almost always the young woman acting alone. Um, now, these are these um, common factors are not always true, of course, but often she's from a lower socioeconomic status, a disadvantaged background. Uh, often she will still live with her parents and um, possibly because of, of this living with her parents, she's, she's afraid of the repercussions of having this baby. Um, I have here as well, lacking a pre-morbid axis one diagnosis. And um, the, the meaning of this is she very often does not have a history of, of depression or history of anxiety or bipolar or schizophrenia. Um, but when we evaluate her subsequent to the crime, she certainly may have symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of, of depression um, related to, um, related to the, the murder. Um, denial or concealment of pregnancy are much more often what we see from a, from a psychiatric psychological perspective. Um, when we're thinking about prevention, the place for prevention of neonaticide is really not the obstetrician's office because um, this pregnancy has been hidden throughout and so she's not going in to get uh, the prenatal care in general. Um, and then this is um, an unwanted pregnancy. So, um, and um, let's talk more about denial of pregnancy. Uh, Laura Miller, who's a, a reproductive psychiatrist, um, did some work describing subtypes, and then we did some more research to, to further flush them out. Um, there are three subtypes of denial of pregnancy, pervasive denial, affective denial, and psychotic denial. Now, pervasive denial is the type that um, you would see on a talk show, uh, where um, the, um, the guest on the talk show says, you know, I, I really didn't gain much, much weight. I had no idea I was pregnant. I, I kept having bleeding, so I thought I wasn't pregnant, and I thought I just had to go to the bathroom, and I had a baby. Um, those cases sound very different from um, 
most of our experiences of, of labor and delivery. And often uh, these, these women may uh, labor uh, quietly and, and relatively quickly uh, compared to um, the rest of the female population. In these cases, um, which are rare, she has uh, kept the existence of the pregnancy and any emotional significance uh, pushed out of her awareness. This is a, a powerful type of uh, denial then. But you can also see um, with, with the often uh, lack of gaining weight, um, perhaps still having cyclical bleeding, et cetera, why um, she might not think she was pregnant, why others around her might not notice. Um, then affective denial, um, the young woman is intellectually aware that she's pregnant, but pushes and pushes it out of her head and doesn't make emotional or physical preparation for uh, the baby. Um, and then psychotic denial is, is, is going to be the, the rarest. And this is women with schizophrenia or another psychotic disorder. If they've had other children, they may have lost custody of those children. And uh, this may be intermittent, right? So she's um, psychotic at the time. Um, she um, is sure that she's not pregnant, but maybe she passes a reflective surface like a, like a window and, and notices and recognizes for a period of time that she's pregnant and then uh, pushes, it, it's, it's gone out of her mind again with the psychosis. So those are the types of a denial of pregnancy. But then we've got uh, concealment of pregnancy as well. And so concealment of pregnancy is the, the young woman knows that she's pregnant, but she's purposely hiding it from others. And uh, there are certainly many cases where um, she had a period of denial of pregnancy first, uh, push, pushing it and then pushing it out of her mind um, or, or not being aware of it, and then um, hiding it once she can no longer hide it from herself. Problem, of course, is, is then comes the reality of the delivery, and there's this baby that uh, she perhaps has not been preparing for. Uh, so um, what can we do to prevent the cases of neonaticide? Um, all 50 states now have safe haven laws. Um, all 50 states have safe haven laws that are slightly better than every other state's safe haven laws, and so they're slightly different all around the country. Uh, they may be um, taking a baby who's up to a day old. They may be taking a baby who's, who's up to several months old to a designated safe haven. Uh, and this may be, depending on the state, a, a hospital, a police station, or a fire station, and uh, safely um, give, giving the baby to, to, to staff uh, safely. And someone sent me this from, from a dumpster um, explaining the safe haven rules as well. So what are other countries doing? In uh, many other uh, nations, there are uh, baby hatches. Uh, when I've lectured at different places, I hear all about the historic uh, baby hatches that places have had uh, there. Uh, the oldest I've heard have been um, hundreds of years old. And uh, now a more modern baby box would be in the bottom right-hand corner of my slide, um, literally in the wall of, of a hospital. And the mother would uh, put the baby in this uh, baby box, baby hatch, and then the staff inside would be alerted that a, that a baby has been uh, safely ab abandoned there. And the goal, of course, is, is to keep the baby uh, safe and unharmed and um, to, to not uh, prosecute the mother for, for abandonment. Uh, France has had an anonymous birth option for decades. Uh, the idea there is that some some of the risk of, of infant mortality, infant death, is from that um, secretive uh, giving birth alone at home. And so the thinking there is if we can bring these uh, young women into the hospital to deliver, we register them as the, a Jane Doe. It's, it's free to give birth, of course, and um, then she can leave with um, us having safely delivered the baby in the hospital. The one point I would make about that is um, why, while it's, 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 it's great and we want to, of course, uh, save as, as many uh, infants as, as possible, um, is the young woman who makes her way to the hospital recognizing the labor pains, the same young woman who thought she had to go to the, the bathroom at, at home and ended up having a baby. Um, and then you also think about, um, do women know about this law? And um, what would it take to um, follow this law appropriately? Um, killing one's 
uh, baby quietly at home versus getting oneself to, to a hospital or a fire station or, or police station, depending on where one lived secretly, whether one has a car, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so then um, I want to turn to filicide and infanticide. And again, if you're my age, you'll recognize these pictures. Otherwise, I will um, tell you what is uh, in the public domain about these cases as well. Um, so filicide is the, um, the, the murder of a, of a child by a parent. Um, in our uh, research, we try to separate it out between um, children who were now adults over the age of 18 and had a different role in the family than um, children from, from birth to age 18. Um, infanticide is a, is a bit of a messier term, as you're aware. Um, about two dozen nations have infanticide laws, um, which tended to be based on the British uh, law from the 1930s. And, and those laws are specifically for only mothers who kill their child, usually up to age 12 months old. And it, um, it gives a, a sentence which generally is more akin to a sentence for manslaughter than for murder in those countries. Um, okay, so what do we know about filicide and infanticide? Interestingly, when you think about the fairy tales that we were told as, as young children, there were a lot of evil stepmothers, um, Snow White, Hansel and Gretel, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And in the anthropology um, uh, research, they talk about um, reasons for, for killing a child in, in the animal kingdom, um, as, as well as, as the human world. And these are some of the suggestions. There is also a term um, that, that came out of the anthropology world um, called the Cinderella effect. Um, and that is um, the term for a stepchild's risk being elevated many times over compared to a biological child's risk. And this is replicated in, in study after study. And um, some of the thinking about why it's evil stepmothers rather than um, I think today we tend to see um, cases of stepfathers is, is that um, back in, in, in days of old, many more women were dying um, in childbirth and many more children would have stepmothers. And then uh, the risk was uh, noted more with, with the stepmothers as well. So um, Dr. Resnick, again here, uh, Professor Emeritus here at, at Case, initially described the motives uh, in the 60s uh, for various uh, child murder by parents. And uh, these, these were the five motives described, and I'll go through uh, each of them. And again, as we're, as we're thinking through these, uh, some may fit for a not guilty by reason of insanity defense, but others uh, certainly uh, would not. Okay, so um, the, the first motive uh, Resnick initially called accidental, um, and that was um, a, a history of chronic abuse or neglect usually. Um, it was a quote unquote accident that the child died that day. I, I don't love the term accidental because it implies that, that, it, that it was an accident, not a foreseeable outcome of, of a chronic um, violent situation. So the, the term we would tend to use now would be fatal maltreatment. It may be fatal neglect. In very rare cases, it may be um, a Munchausen syndrome by proxy case. Um, the mechanism of death in these cases is most commonly going to be head trauma. And, and this is some data from the National Child Abuse and Neglect uh, data system. And about um, two out of 100,000 uh, kids are gonna be killed uh, by fatal child maltreatment. Um, we always hear in the media about uh, Child Protective Services not, um, not picking up on these cases in advance. And this is some of the problem though, when you look at how many uh, families, how many children are reported, um, there are 471 per 100,000 referred. Then with their screening process and looking into the cases, they substantiate 91 out of those 471. Stepping back even further, there are two deaths, but only the minority of, of those two had been reported to Child Protective Services in the past. So really out of that 471 reported cases, you're looking for the one. Um, obviously very difficult to do. Um, we do know that younger children uh, who are not um, going to school, um, et, et cetera, and seen by other adults are, are, are at higher uh, risk than, than older children as well. And it may be one parent acting alone, both parents acting together. 
um, or, um, or difficult to, to, to tell uh, based on what the uh, suspects are reporting. So what we see in these cases, um, we see uh, anger, we see frustration at the child. Um, sometimes the parent will talk about having been disciplining the child, although it's obviously not appropriate discipline, um, lacking in parenting skills. And again, um, as you'll see throughout my talk, we're seeing some cases of substance abuse, um, illicit substances, alcohol, and also was, was the child mentally unwell. Now, as far as prevention, there is uh, reporting to Child Protective Services, of course, and then um, there are child uh, death reviews, usually set up by um, statute in the, in the different states um, with multidisciplinary teams looking at each individual child death and how they, they could be prevented. Um, um, the second motive is unwanted child. Um, unfortunately, self-explanatory. Self this is uh, the parent uh, sees the child as a hindrance to something the parent wants. And um, this, this may be related to, for example, um, personality uh, issues in, in the parent, for example. Um, the, the least common type would be the um, partner revenge, spouse revenge, so-called Medea syndrome. And uh, you'll remember from Greek mythology, uh, Medea uh, killed her children after Jason, her partner, was cheating on her. Uh, and, and these cases tend to happen, again, in um, disputed custody cases, for example, punishing the other parents by killing their child. Um, the, the problem, just like those CPS cases we were talking about, is how you find the, the one case out of the so many heated custody battles where, where this is actually a, a risk and a concern. Uh, the fourth motive Resnick described was altruistic uh, murder of the children. Um, and this is uh, murder out of love, which I know I need to explain. So um, this can happen in several different ways and we further um, categorized it in our research. So this may be a quote unquote extended suicide case where the uh, parent is suicidal, depressed, loves this child, would, would never leave them alone in this awful world that the parent themselves is departing and thus plans to kill the child as, as well as themselves. Um, as well, um, we see cases of altruistic murder out of love to relieve that child's suffering. Now, the parent may psychotically, out of touch with reality, believe that the child is suffering or it may not be psychotic. In the psychotic cases, uh, the parent may believe that some fate worse than death is about to befall the child. They're about to be sold into sex slavery, and the parent thinks they're sparing the child from that horrible outcome. In the non-psychotic cases, it tended to be parents who were depressed, and uh, their child had gotten a, a horrible medical diagnosis, and they imagined their, their child suffering and that they were taking them out of their misery. Uh, the final motive Resnick described uh, was called acutely psychotic. In these cases, there was no comprehensible motive. Um, they may have been in the throes of, of delirium or mania or epilepsy, for example. Now, uh, the Andrea Yates case, uh, you may recall, she uh, drowned her five children, the youngest of whom is not pictured here. She was described uh, by everyone as a loving mother, but she developed postpartum psychosis. Um, her family was in a cult-like religion, and with her illness, she developed the delusion, the fixed false belief that she was the one true Satan. Uh, also in uh, her beliefs, um, uh, she had uh, the belief from her religion that her kids would go to hell if they reached age seven, the age of responsibility. Um, in this uh, religion, they took the Bible very literally, um, hell, fire, and brimstone. Um, and she thought um, in her delusional thinking that if she killed her children, they would go to heaven while they were still young. Also in her delusional thinking, because she was um, Satan, remember, um, she believed that then Governor Bush would give her the death penalty and thereby she would save the world from Satan. Um, she was eventually found not guilty by reason of insanity and hospitalized in a forensic hospital. Now, that is a very different case from this, this other uh, case of filicide, which was also a drowning of children, and that was the Susan Smith case from uh, August 1994. 
Um, on the left, we see Susan Smith and her estranged husband, David. And if, if you were around the summer of 1994, you will remember seeing her pleading um, day after day on national TV for the black man who carjacked the car with the kids in the back seat to please just return her children. Those of us who had small children at the time, that was these were um, scary uh, things that were happening. Nine days later, under the pressure of police questioning, she admits that she drowned her children in the local lake, um, drove into them, uh, drove into the lake uh, in the car with the children in their car seats. She claimed that she was depressed and suicidal and thought she would kill them too. So she was claiming an altruistic motive. Uh, prosecutors said uh, she had been having an affair with a, uh, the wealthiest man in town, the factory owner. When they talked about marriage, um, he said something that he wouldn't want to raise someone else's children. And uh, therefore, what the prosecutors brought forward was an unwanted child uh, motive. And she was eventually received a life sentence. So when we look at the studies about uh, parents who kill, um, there are much more studies about mothers who kill than fathers. But an important thing is that we need to separate out, is this a study looking at the general population of mothers who killed, or is it looking at a subpopulation like mothers who were mentally unwell at the time or mothers who, who went to prison? Uh, so when we look at the general population studies internationally, we find similar to what we found in, in other things we've been talking about this afternoon, women who tend to be of, of, of lower means, they tend to be socially isolated, full-time caregivers of their child. Uh, they often themselves have been victims of domestic violence and, and substance abuse is, is not uncommon. The, the psychiatric studies, um, women who um, have killed their children and then been found not guilty by reason of insanity or who were found uh, incompetent to stand trial, um, we find women who were psychotic at the time, and often they had delusions about their child. We find uh, mothers with depression, uh, suicidality, who have often used mental health services in the past. Uh, there's also an, a term from the older literature, motherless mothers, and, and, and I don't tend to be too um, psychodynamic or psychoanalytic, but um, this is something that comes up again and again, and this is that many of these um, mothers uh, for various reasons, never um, really um, learned how to be mothers. They lost their own mothers at an early age due to divorce or death, uh, et cetera. Um, but again, like we're talking about the difficulty with uh, child protective services, um, figuring out who is going to be at highest risk. Uh, here's, here's a piece of, of, of data that is from one of the few studies really looking at this closely. And they asked mothers who had infants or toddlers up to age three, whether they ever had thoughts of, of harming their child. And of the mothers with, with depression, 41% said yes. Now this is gonna be a confidential or, or an anonymous survey. And certainly we're not gonna be thinking that 41% actually um, meant and wanted to harm their child um, more that they, they had these thoughts, but it, it needs to be a conversation that we're um, thinking about as well. You said they would get the Okay. Um, and then uh, finally, I, we're skipping over a murder in the family by the offspring, by, by the child, um, but I just want to earmark that that's one of the types of cases as well. So um, finally, turning to familicide um, and um, looking at a description of family annihilation by uh, Park Dietz, who is a forensic psychiatrist, um, who uh, this is one of my favorite quotes about the topic. Again, familicide is often a, a gendered crime there's often this patriarchal view of the family. And what Dietz wrote was uh, the perpetrator of the familicide is usually the senior man of the house, depressed, paranoid, intoxicated, or a combination of these. He kills every member of the family who is present, sometimes including pets. And, and this um, killing of pets is, is not uncommon in these cases. Um, in, in, in cases, um, we've, we've also had even uh, um, neighbors who, who come to see what the noise is um, get killed as, as well. So then the things we often see um, it, looking at the context of familicide cases, for some reason, a breakdown of the family relationship, the, the marriage is ending, the father is facing separation from the children, there are uh, financial stresses, in rare cases, um, honor killings. But again, you're hearing from me, there may or may not be mental illness in these cases. 
So to finish up, looking at some of the overarching themes in these various types of cases that we've seen today, I would say these are families often grappling with significant stressors, be they financial, employment, or illness related. And for some reason, um, the, the perpetrator perceives these stresses as insurmountable. Um, um, when we think about um, each of these types of cases, I want to remind us again that there are multiple motives Less. for the same events. So we talked about the, the two cases of, of, of children being drowned with very different motives, but that's true whether we're looking at intimate partner homicides um, and, and other types of cases, really thinking about what the motive in this case was. Sometimes there was a lack of attachment to the other person, but, but very often in these cases, what we see is, is family members uh, loving the best they could. In all of these types, we, we see that, that there may be an altruistic element. Some of these cases are, are altruistic murders, um, whether it's the partner, the child, or the parent doing the killing. And we often see themes of, of anger, suspicion, or, or resentment uh, as well. Uh, so um, from a psychiatric perspective, um, I, I think that knowledge about these motives can help steer our prevention efforts, both within psychiatry and, and uh, within uh, pu public health as, as well. And uh, a big message is that um, in prevention, it's often the final fatal outcome of these violent family relationships. And so prevention of intimate partner violence, prevention of uh, child abuse are, are where we need to be thinking as well. And then uh, within mental health, if, if there are mental health or substance abuse issues and someone's working with a psychiatrist, a psychologist, um, what we're doing on the individual level for prevention is addressing the, the risk factors uh, that, that have potential to change um, in, in prevention. Um, and these are some other uh, prevention thoughts about the altruistic cases, looking for burnout, looking for depression, et cetera. Uh, so, so in conclusion, uh, there are multiple motives for each of the types of murder in the family, but we are seeing some, some threads uh, running through it of stressed, overwhelmed families, um, et cetera. As you've heard me uh, talk for the last uh, 45 minutes, uh, mental illness is not present in all cases. It's, it's present in some cases. And um, we, we've talked a little as well about um, the, the insanity defense and who, who may qualify. And remember we said that was the, the mental illness causing the person not to know the wrongfulness. So that's only present in, in some of the cases even with mental illness. And then when we're thinking about prevention, we wanna be thinking about um, what is the context, what are the antecedents and, and what are the motives? Um, and, and so with that, I'll wrap up and we can go to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and let me see if I have questions here. Uh, yes, one of them is, is there a medical standard regarding the obligation to notify police of any warning signs of, or of danger in the family? If so, could you elaborate? Uh, no, so um, in, in general, um, if, if so if someone's seeing a, a psychiatrist and we're worried about risk, we would uh, do, do a risk assessment. And uh, um, we, we have then, if we determine that someone's at elevated risk, mm -hmm. um, our, our usual uh, decision-making would be for, for psychiatric hospitalization um, in, in general to then uh, contain that risk uh, as a first step. Okay. Do the factors you identified remain the same outside of the US or is there something unique in other countries? Oh, that's an excellent question. That's my, um, I guess I often talk about culture and, and its uh, relationship with um, some of these forensic topics. And um, I, I um, worked in New Zealand for seven years and actually um, was doing a lot of the work on this, this book um, while I was in New Zealand. Uh, so a lot of the, the risk factors are gonna be the same. Um, across uh, countries, across cultures, but um, some of them are going to come out in different ways. And so, for example, um, when I was talking about denial of pregnancy and neonaticide and the young woman's fear of, of being kicked out of the family, depending on the society that, that one is in and how um, unwed pregnancy is, is dealt with, that may Im impact whether she has those fears. Um, so a, a more um, a culture that's very rigid about that um, may have um, 
may have differences in, in the um, hidden pregnancy um, outcomes as well. So she may be afraid of being kicked out of the religion, being afraid of kicked out of the culture as well. And then also on the um, familicide slide, I included honor killings, um, rare in the US, but um, in, in other places, um, honor killings may be, may be more of, of different types of, of family murders uh, as well. And um, I guess, I'm, uh, sorry, I'm giving a long way to answer because I think it's such an important um, question. And, and that is um, a social, social economic status as, as well and, and the, the, the means for um, taking care of one's children um, as well. And the other things that uh, Child Protective Services might uh, put in place um, other than just removal of the child uh, may be different in different cultures and countries too. Great. Have you seen more of these family murders during COVID-19? There certainly is a concern, and there is a concern about if if if, if these cases um, could could be hidden during COVID-19 because um, we're all so um, you know siloed in our homes and our, our bubbles, and um, there um, there have been re reports in in the news um, continue about um, cases that happen in lockdown, and we're certainly worried about the individual risk factors that we've talked about in COVID. This is another great question, so I'm gonna go on a little bit. Um, so risk of intimate partner violence, especially with the increased stressors of, of the pandemic. So um, loss of income, uh, financial insecurity, um, lack of um, the, the perhaps um, use of other coping strategies like you know leave, leaving the house and going for a walk um, or, or whatever uh, when one's stressed out. So um, there is concern about um, high, higher risk of, of intimate partner violence, also concern about higher risk of, of child abuse, right? The, the frustrations, the um, being with one's child constantly um, and um, not being uh, prepared for at-home learning, et cetera. And we're, you know, we're certainly seeing re reports in the media, but um, the way the statistics kind of, kind of lag behind a, a couple of years, we, we won't know the, the full numbers uh, for, for a while. How about social media? Has that had any effect in this area? That's really interesting. Um, I think it's 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 certainly making people more more aware, and so there are a lot of um, podcasts, et cetera, that that talk about uh, family violence and 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 murders. Um, I'm not aware of any data suggesting it, it changing the rates, but I. I, I I think it's it's a positive thing, more, more people being aware of this and thinking about it. Has research yielded any consistent explanation for situations where only one child is targeted and murdered in a family of multiple children? These are great questions, you guys. Okay, so um, it, some of those cases, so there's, it's, um, I would say they're not like large studies of this and it's, it's very difficult to, to do a study of, of filicide for, for the fortunate reason that it's it's a rare crime and you have to gather enough cases together to, to get statistical significance, et cetera. However, um, what, we, what we know, thinking about the different motives that we talked about uh, when one child is killed and, and looking at it in that way, I can say that in cases of that Medea syndrome, the partner revenge, where the um, one partner is punishing, in quotes, the, the other parent by, by killing the child. If that parent kills one child, it tends to be the favorite child of that parent because they think they're, they're punishing them the most. Um, in other cases, it, it may be that, um, that the parent kills the, the younger children and spares the older children. Um, that's been shown with some, some data and that could be due to um, the parent uh, thinking that the older child is more likely to um, uh, be able to, to live without the parent, et cetera. Um, and, and so it's, I would say there's not like an overarching single, single finding about that, but then it really um, goes back to the, to the motives as well. Well, I only have time for one more question. So let's have the question be, what are the trends? Is this getting better or worse in, in recent years? Um, so um, <laughs> it's, it's a good question, and, and there are these, these various kind of types and, and, and different, um, different uh, rates of, of the different types of, of family homicide. So there are these various um, protection measures, and uh, so for one example, 
um, if if it was if it could be proven that the the case is abandoned in safe havens of of the neonaticide of the potential neonaticide uh, neonates the infants, um, if if those would have been uh, homicides, then then each of those rep represents a safe life, uh, for example. Okay, well, we have lots of comments saying how fascinating the presentation was and thanking you, and I want to thank you as well. I think it is time to share the CLE slide. So let me see if I can bring it up. Okay, so this is Murder in the Family, Perpetrators, Motives, and Prevention. You will earn one CLE for this program. Please complete the evaluation link. It is available in the chat box or your registration confirmation email. The evaluation has to be completed within 48 hours. And here is the code. The code is 457762, 457762. Please allow 30 days for your CLE to appear. And if you have any questions about it, please contact Patty Harbold. I don't know anything about CLE, but Patty knows everything about everything. And her email is pmk10 at case.edu. So thank you again for attending. We hope to see you at our future programs and stay safe and healthy. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.